Let's get to our big story. It is the showdown in Happy Valley. Buckeyes and Nittany Lions will be the sixth straight time that they will meet with both ranked in the top 20. That's the longest streak this century in the Big Ten. Not surprisingly, three of the four top matchups on that front involve the Buckeyes. Ohio State's won each of the previous five in this current streak by an average of a touchdown. Penn State was unranked the last time it beat Ohio State. That was back in 2016. I'm really interested in Penn State, so I want to start there. We saw them play against Michigan. They did not measure up well. The game was deceptively close at halftime, and then Michigan blew them out in the second half, but again, rushing for more than 400 yards, completely dominating the line of scrimmage. And then we saw Penn State bounce back and have a nice performance last week. How big do you think this game is in terms of being almost a referendum on Penn State and whether they belong in that conversation with Michigan and the Buckeyes? I think it's the deciding factor. Now, let's go back to the Michigan game. Again, you know, the dreaded off week. I mean, it bites us all. A long year in coaching, you make really important decisions during that bye week, and sometimes they're good decisions, sometimes they're bad decisions. So my take on Penn State at Michigan was I, I, I think the separation was less than the final score, or those you say – at one point, Penn State was winning 14-13. They yeah. had run like nine plays. Whatever, <laughs> right. whatever, I know you know the numbers. first down in the first half. <laughs> right, whatever the status. Uh, so, I th- so I think the off week has something uh, to do with it. So now you go to State College. Ohio State goes there. Uh, what's it going to look like? They have, the, they have the home crowd behind them. Uh, their, their, their pride's hurt, obviously, because like everyone else, they're not looking at the last game they played. They're looking at that that Michigan game. So, you know, where are they as a program? If you if you go to the recruiting signing days, they're right there with Ohio State, right? I mean, it's, it's them, Michigan, and Ohio State. But it hasn't been that way when they've played Michigan and Ohio State. It hasn't been that way all the time. And then I go way back, Robert. They won the Big Ten East and West three years after James Franklin got there. So I think it is where is this Penn State compared to both Michigan and Ohio State? X and O-wise, I don't think anything really favors Penn State, you know, other than the home crowd. It would allow Clifford maybe versus a really, very pressured Jim Knowles, Ohio State defense. It will allow Clifford to change the play, get in the right play. It, it might allow them to have a bigger audible package than if they were playing in Columbus where they wouldn't be able to hear or in Ann Arbor. So when you say, does it tell us a lot about Penn State, not, te- not only team but program, I think it tells us a whole bunch what the final result is. Is it potentially just a little bit better matchup in that Ohio State, while they have run the ball more this year, actually, than they've thrown it in terms of, of you know, call plays, they are, we would think of them as their, their biggest threat is as a passing team, right? I mean, they've just got this incredible group of wide receivers. They have a Heisman candidate quarterback, whereas Michigan, it was certainly obvious in that game against Penn State, they were more ground-focused. They absolutely dominated, as I mentioned, in the run game. I'm not saying it favors Penn State, the, but their secondary is really good. And right. so the notion of facing a passing-based attack rather than a ground-based attack, again, cognizant of the fact Ohio State's run it more than they've thrown it this year, but that's where they test you the most, it's where they frighten you the most. I'm not saying that favors Penn State, but is that a better scenario than facing Michigan? I think that question intensifies the evaluation of the Penn State team and program. They couldn't stop an aggressive running attack, right? The amount of yards that Michigan ran was over 400 yards. It, yes. It's crazy, right, that, that, that someone could rush for over 400 yards against a Penn State defense. So now your question is, okay, let's see how they can do against an elite passing attack. Yeah. So you take those two games, you forget about all the other games, and you compare those three teams. And so if, if Ohio State has their way with the Penn State pass defense, then it's another notch that they have separated further down from Ohio State. It's a great question because we're going to find out how they defend an elite running game and how they defend an elite passing game. I think it's really fascinating just on the front that were Penn State to lose this game and lose it convincingly, I think you start making the argument, we were talking about this a little bit on our phone call in preparation for tailgate this morning, that you can really start to make this argument that it's Ohio State and Michigan and everyone else, which, which it was for a long time, certainly was when I grew up and started right. following this league, and then it, it didn't feel like it was that for a while. 
it's starting to feel that way again. Right. Even 100 years ago when I was born, it was always the big two and the little eight. You're right? exaggerating <laughs> only slightly. <laughs> only slightly. <laughs> uh, the big two and the little eight was what I grew up as, yes. as a young, yeah, and that's, as and a young coach and as a player. And you, right, and you right. Too. No, I started going to games in 1975 in the Big Ten. It was Ohio State, Michigan, and everyone else. Right. And so to think that we could ever get back to those days, you know, think – and this is funny because somehow I could tie it into – to uh, the NIL, to the transfer portal, and all that. No matter what you do to the rules, you know, the best teams potentially always can separate themselves from ev everybody else. And no matter what the rules say, there's always going to be have and have nots. Now, Penn State certainly is not a have not, but, you know, Penn State's history before the Big Ten, they dominated East Coast football. They go to Arizona and beat Miami, uh, University of Miami, right? Because the, the thinking in the coaching profession was they were well rested from playing a week schedule. They certainly had a lot of great players, and they could match up with anybody given a, a weaker schedule and a time off to get ready for a bowl game. So you're right. And again, I go back to Penn State winning the conference as it is organized now. Yes. Third year of Jim, James Franklin's tenure. No one will be happier if and when the Big Ten gets rid of divisions oh. than Penn State, right? It is a. Well, I'll be right there with them. <laughs> no one will be happier than Penn State and Jerry Denoe. I'm not sure as part of the equation. I know, I know. They say to themselves, like, what would ultimately what would make Jerry happy? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about the other game, Michigan and Michigan State? So. Michigan State, as everyone who's watching presumably knows, won this game the last couple of years. So Mel Tucker's come in. Mm -hmm. The first year was odd, no doubt, but they won the game. Uh, it was the COVID year. It, Michigan was a disaster, as we know. But then last year, a really good Michigan team, mm -hmm. a Michigan team that made the college football playoff, Michigan State still beat them. Also a weird game, but again, Michigan State won the game. What does this game tell us about relatively where these programs are, given the struggles Michigan State has had this year. And we can go f not that far back. Mark D'Antonio always had success against Michigan as well. So last year, you know, and obviously this is, I mean, the motivation for Michigan has to be revenge. I know we're not allowed to say, or the coaches aren't allowed to say that, but we all know it's real. So, so other than that, program-wise, I, I think there's also the question of separation between Michigan and Michigan State, but for all the diff a lot of different reasons than the Penn State, Ohio State conversation. Mel Tucker took the conference by storm with the portal, right, with Kenneth Walker and all the things that he did. And he organized his back room, uh, his legal back room. I, I shouldn't use that term because it sounds like it sounds, sounds shady. shady. It, it does, does, but yes. it's not shady. It's, it's part of the rules. But, but Mel's organization recruiting is like the NFL. He's got the draft and he's got free agency, meaning he's got recruiting and the portal. So w when, you live in, when you live that life, you have the opportunity of being a little bit up and down. Right, because it's not based on your draft; it's based based on your trades, much similar to the NFL. So, if this gets one-sided against Michigan State, it's it's almost not as alarming as a team that's building through recruiting, because Mel Tucker's team next year could be an entirely different team. So, it's harder to gauge if there is a separation. Now, we're talking about the team that has lost the last two years in this game. Yes. as separating from Michigan State. Yeah. It's kind of contrary to, to what's happened recently. And they could win three in a row on Saturday, right? But it's a different type of comparison because Mel has chosen the portal as a, as a major way to impact this program. Yeah, I mean, I would still say, and I'm not in any way diminishing what Michigan State did last year. They had a fabulous mm -hmm. year, particularly given where they were coming from. I still say at the end of the year, again, I know Michigan State won the game head-to-head. -head. Michigan was the better team right. last year, as evidenced by them making the college football playoff. That, that doesn't take anything away from Michigan State's accomplishment. And I, I do find that really interesting, that the model for some programs can change. And so kind of this notion of if you are going to build through the portal, which Mel has made it clear they are. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I do think he said last year was unusual because of the circumstance that he found him in himself in, but he still clearly sees the portal as a major way to build the program, but he hit some, not just home runs, but he had a grand slam with Kenneth Walker, and can you hit a grand slam every year? Hard to say. And I do think he's he's still in the part of his program that is the, the, the recruiting or the draft, part of that program, he's still more active with the four stars than Mark D'Antonio was. Mark D'Antonio wanted to recruit in a certain radius. He wanted to see every recruit 
be on campus three or four times, either through summer camps or through coming to games. So that was more traditional the way Mark was there a long time and had a lot of success. That worked for him. So now you have someone that will more likely go after the four stars. And, and five use, stars, frankly. And, and I mean, five they've, stars. They've had some big time guys on campus. So that, so that is really, uh, you, when you look at the two ways the programs were organized, Mark D'Antonio and Mel Tucker, there couldn't be any two programs further away. So it's going to take a little bit more time. Yeah, pretty interesting. Uh, X and L wise, you see Michigan with a clear advantage here? I see Michigan with a clear advantage. I think uh, it'll be interesting to see J.J. during the off week. And they, they, by the way, they both have off weeks, which I know people that are watching know that. But, you know, how, you, how you've managed the off week. But I would suggest to you one thing they've probably done with J.J. is made a cut up and really do dove into his uh, technique into his decisions, which you can't really do very deeply when you're playing week in and week out. The one thing J.J. definitely needs to improve is his long ball, and that's one of, one of the reasons is he has to put more air under it, and he, he's, he's not doing that. So that's something they, they can work out. But, yes, to answer your question, X and O, I don't see anything that favors Michigan State. Except for the fact they've had a great track record, right, against it. It's the one it's thing big in this game. No, yeah. it is. Well, and we were talking about this yesterday. With Pat Forty, and I mentioned that at Big Ten Media Days, every single person you talked to from Michigan, when you said, well, what can you do to build on last year? They said, well, we could beat Ohio State and Michigan State in the same year. Right. So it's clearly a point of emphasis. But it, it's, it's amazing. I mean, 33-3 and three at home against unranked teams under Jim Harbaugh, and two of those three losses are Michigan State. Right. So even in the scenario where it seems like Michigan has the – the better team, Michigan State, has figured out a way. Pat. Awards Day in Big Ten Women's Soccer. As expected, the individual awards dominated by conference champ Michigan State, one of the best stories in the sport this year, have the Coach of the Year in Jeff Hostler, Forward of the Year in Lauren DeBow, Defender of the Year, Ruby Diodati, and Unanimous Goalkeeper of the Year in Lauren Kozel. Other award winners, Wisconsin's Emma Jaskinick, the Midfielder of the Year, and Northwestern's Katarina Regazzoni, the freshman of the year. First team all-conference squad includes Dubow and Kozel as the two unanimous picks. Penn State's Ali Schlegel tied for the conference lead in goals, a first-team pick as well. You see the rest of the honorees. Congratulations to each and every one of them. The conference tournament starts Sunday with matches here on the network as well as on Big Ten+. Plus. You are used to hearing Joel Klatt every Saturday in the booth during Fox's Big Noon kickoff game. But if you want to hear even more from Joel and his unfiltered thoughts on all the biggest stories in college football, make sure you subscribe to the Joel Klatt Show wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes drop three times a week. And we are always pleased one time a week to welcome Joel to our show. Uh, Joel, before we look ahead, I want to look back as we kind of always do. You had the Ohio State-Iowa game this past week. Interested in your take from both sides. Let's start with Ohio State. They put up a historic total against Iowa. Most points anyone has scored against a Kirk Ferentz-led team. And yet, it still seemed like there were some question marks, particularly around the run game. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't even think they played well. I mean, I mean, to be honest with you. And I said it during the broadcast, and everyone was like, it's 40 to 10. I don't, I, I don't care. Like, they, they did not play well. This was the second worst running, uh, rushing game under Ryan Day, uh, only to Michigan last year. Um, I think they played well on, on defense, but I don't really know how to evaluate that because of who they were playing, to be quite honest. And I'm not trying to be mean, right? Because then in the same breath, you can say, and they still won 54 to 10. So isn't that kind of scary that Ohio State can play that way and still beat a team like Iowa and beat them as bad as anyone's ever beat a Kirk Ferentz team? And I think that that's uh, kind of uh, what I'm suggesting. I think that this defense allows them the opportunity to struggle at times in a series here or there offensively and not immediately be in trouble uh, in getting beat, right? This is the fifth ranked scoring defense and, and second in total defense, I believe, in the country right now, top five in each. And what they did is that they were able to just continue to get the football back for their offense. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Rev, Iowa's game plan is always, their blueprint, is to make it a 9, 10, 11 possession game. Okay? And through eight possessions for Ohio State offensively, Iowa was doing exactly what they needed to do to potentially upset the Buckeyes. Ohio State had only scored 19 offensive points through their first eight 
offensive possessions. Okay, so at that time, it should be, or through those eight possessions, it should be about six minutes to go in the fourth quarter. If Iowa is playing the correct way, the complimentary way with their run game, with their offense, with their special teams. But the problem was, it was only 1144 left in the third quarter. So subsequent drives, four in a row, Ohio State scores, touchdown, 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 and Iowa cannot compete that way. So it was Ohio State's defense that was the catalyst to winning this game and to getting the ball back for their offense so that they could start getting that rhythm and then eventually score the 54 points that they did. Okay, and I, I hear you on all that. I guess I'm just curious how much of this do you think is a function of Ohio State really being that much better on defense and how much of it is a function of Iowa? I mean, this is a historically yeah. bad Iowa offense. Not only are they last in the nation in total offense or last in the Big Ten in total offense by more than 100 yards per game. I mean, it's kind of staggering where they are. So it's kind of a two-pronged question. I'm, I'm asking yeah. you about it in the context of Ohio State, but I guess I'm just curious. Now, you've seen Iowa a couple times. How can they get out of this funk here, Joel? I mean, because as you well know, they have a very passionate fan base and they sure. are really frustrated. Okay, so the Iowa issues are are <laughs> – they really boil down to one thing. And, and here's why I'm hesitating. is because I don't love criticizing players. And, and yet, the offensive line is just not good enough, Rev. Okay? And so it doesn't matter what plays you're calling. It doesn't matter what the quarterback is doing if the offensive line is not good enough. Now, that being said, the problem with Iowa is that they don't block people up front uh, to the requisite level. And then what they're not doing is they're not getting good run uh, rushing attack from either any of their backs. The quarterbacks don't make the right reads. Um, and it, at a, eventually that's boiling down to like, well, okay, so the coaching staff has to do something. You know, show us that what you're doing in practice can help further the development of the offensive side. Um, it's a really... It's a really staggering issue that they're in right now because the confidence has completely left that side of the football. And I know, I mean, even Kirk Ferentz, who I think is normally, you know, I think pretty measured, lashing out at times uh, with some questions from the media. I thought that that was interesting. It's not a great situation right now for Iowa, and, and I don't know how to evaluate Ohio State's defense because of that. But I will say this. That's not their job. Ohio State's defense is not to not to put the other offense out there and say, okay, now we we can be evaluated. Their job is to dominate whoever's in front of them, and they did that. I think it was eight eight first downs, something like that, 158 total yards, and one of 13 on third down. Those are better numbers than let's say the Michigan defense put up against the Iowa team. So from Ohio State's perspective, all they can do is go out there and play whoever's in front of them, uh, and and they did that to a great degree. I ask you that though, really in the context of this game coming up this week, which you're going to have on Big Noon as well the matchup with Penn State and yeah. look at Penn State and here is a team with a much more dynamic run game than they had a year ago. They've got a couple wide receivers who can be real matchup problems. Sean Clifford as much as I know at times he has frustrated Penn State fans. He's putting up really good numbers yeah. again. So how big a challenge do you think this is for the Ohio State defense this week against the Nittany Lions. I mean, it's, it's substantially bigger than, than what they faced a, a week ago for the, the reasons that I was, I was talking about. But, but I will say this, is that the blueprint to beat this Ohio State team was really laid out last year, and it starts with your ability to run the ball. Both Oregon and Michigan ran the ball really effectively, both for over seven yards per carry in each one of those games. Uh, combined, they ran for 566 yards. You have to control the game. The style of the game it has to be played on, on, on your level, if you will. And so the run game for Penn State is not just like, hey, we hope we run it better. They have to control the game. They have to run it really well against this Ohio State defense that has played better against the run. Uh, I also think that, that when you look at their ability to throw the ball, they're going to test Ohio State as best uh, at, as well as anybody really has. And that's one of the areas that we don't really know about the Buckeye defense is the corners. Can they cover? And can they hold up in coverage? Uh, it's, it's something that I think the question is going to remain until we see them do it against a really good opponent. And I think with guys like Parker Washington on the outside, they will be tested. Now, <laughs> that being said, Rev, and I know I'm kind of bouncing all over the place here, 
Penn State better stop the Buckeye run or else what happened uh, to them against Michigan will happen against Ohio State, which is their offense was completely one-handed and one-dimensional because of the style of game that they were playing in from the get-go. And so I think it's it's twofold there and it's complementary and their defense is going to have to play better in particular stopping the run. And it is interesting to think like will Ohio State kind of have something to prove trying to run the ball after the Iowa game because to me this was they the should. flaw right when this was the flaw last year right that in the yeah. games where they had to run the ball and there were only a couple of them they weren't able they to couldn't. do it and, and that was That's why right. they got beat and so then you get a game against Iowa where they didn't have to run the ball but they couldn't run the ball and, and so now do they they try to show that it's different against a team that gave up more than 400 rushing yards against Michigan. I I think that you're going to see an offense and a play caller that wants to make a point with the run game. That's what I think. Yeah. Hey, I do want to ask you before we let you go, the first uh, college football playoff rankings are going to be out next week. <laughs> They'll come out before you and I speak. Yeah. There aren't a ton of marquee matchups, frankly, this week where you think these, this is one that could really disrupt the rankings, although I suppose that's kind of the fun of, of college football. But if everything kind of holds form this week the top ranked teams hold serve against somewhat lesser opponents what are the question marks that you'll be watching the the things that you'll be watching most closely when that first ranking comes out yeah I, I mean I think that you're going to find out a lot about exactly what the committee thinks about Michigan's schedule so far and Ohio State's schedule so far uh, based on who the other teams around them have beaten and played I think that there's a good chance even with, let's say, Ohio State beats Penn State, even if they were to beat Penn State, I think there's a good chance that Ohio State and Michigan fall below Tennessee, Georgia, and probably Clemson based on the ranked wins that those other teams have, in particular Oregon. As Oregon plays better, that's going to be a huge uh, uh, bump for Georgia. And throughout history, I, I just... You know how I feel about the, the playoff committee and how we're ranking these teams. I don't think it's very consistent. And something tells me that like this iteration of the committee is really going to look at like strength of schedule, strength of schedule. Who did you beat? What's your marquee wins? And if, and if that's the conversation, then I think Ohio State and Michigan will actually fall below those other three teams and, and kind of the undefeated uh, breadth there in the top five. So wouldn't surprise you at all if both those teams were to win this weekend, that one or by, I mean, you, you certainly expect Ohio State to be in the top four. Would you expect Ohio State to be higher than Michigan? I mean, they, they've been higher in the rankings, although, you know, look, we're uh, a year removed, obviously, from Michigan being Ohio State. Michigan's done nothing to diminish its ranking other than to play an inferior schedule. Is it your belief that kind of at this moment right now the committee would rank Ohio State ahead of Michigan? Uh, the, uh, Ohio State would need the Penn State win, but once, once, and in and the, and the hypothetical, once they were to get it, if they did, I think that they would put them ahead of Michigan. Yes. All right, we will have uh, a lot to talk about a week from now, I'm sure. Have a great call. Enjoy the game on Saturday. We we'll look man. forward to to hearing you guys on the air. Good to see you. Time for our big stat: Illinois leading the nation in scoring D, less than nine points per game. On pace to have the second best unit this century in college football. National champ Alabama 2011 was the best. That had Dante Hightower, haha, Clinton Dix. That Miami team was a national champ as well with Vince Wilfork, Jonathan Vilma, Ed Reed. So it was some heady company for the Fighting Illini. They are coming off a bye, Jerry. They're taking on Nebraska. What would it take for the Huskers to pull off an upset here? Okay, so let's start with the mental game. First of all, they both had the week off, as you mentioned. Brett Bielema is a veteran head coach. We've already talked about this. By games are tricky. Uh, Mickey has not been veteran head coach dealing with by games. So they both have made really important decisions during this week that they didn't play. The problem Brett has is his team has had two weeks to be told that they've invented the game, right? <laughs> I mean, you're an Illinois football player. Everybody you see is talking about what you've done, what you've done, what you've done. Unbelievable, unbelievable, unbelievable. Meanwhile, Nebraska's back in Lincoln, okay? Nobody's bothering them. Nobody's giving them a chance, and they're, they're getting ready for a game. 
Uh, I would say the best chance that Nebraska has to win is, number one, Illinois could be flat, and I think that's a distinct possibility because of what I just said. And the second thing, they can be explosive on offense. Mark Whipple, offensive coordinator, he's a little bit of a draw it up in the dirt guy, and sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. I think this week that's good because he's had two weeks to put a game plan in that could catch the Illinois defense, which is fabulous, a little bit off guard. So – I think everything leads to this is the, the biggest chance that Illinois has had to be upset so far this year. Yeah, and you feel like the crowd will be fired up, certainly in Lincoln, right? You're Always going are. on the road. I just wonder, and this is something else we were talking about on our call today, I think maybe Howard brought it up, that whether or not Nebraska can protect well enough to actually get those downfield shots. Uh, I mean, Illinois has been, they've been hard to throw it on, but part of the reason they've been hard to throw it on is they're pressuring at the second highest percentage of anyone in college football. Yeah, I, I mean, Howard is 100% right, but that's a defensive line that's ready to play. Yeah, yeah. That's emotional. I that's playing at a high level. There's no doubt if they both play at the same level, Illinois should win the game. But, but it's... It's not that simple. Either that or we'll never have another upset in the history of college football. <laughs> I mean, it's one or the other. Nebraska, 20 straight losses against ranked teams. These just have not been the kinds of games that they have won, but we'll see. Right, and, yeah. and remember how Nebraskans think. They're a brand name. Yeah. Illinois is not. So that stat that, that you said, that, yeah. to them, that's, that's nothing. We're Nebraska. Right. They still cling to their history. They, and that gives them confidence yeah. in, in a situation like this. No, I hear you. What about Minnesota Rutgers? I find this game so interesting. I mean, obviously, Minnesota's fallen on really hard times. They've lost three straight games. They can't get anything done on offense. I, I mean, I think you could argue that Rutgers feels a lot better about themselves coming into this game than Minnesota does. Okay, so let's go back to the bus tour. We go to both those schools, obviously. Minnesota looks like one of the best teams we've seen. They're going to be in the Western Division hunt. Rutgers is making steady progress. Let's go back three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Minnesota is the second or third best team in the conference. And now you have Rutgers, who is in the bottom of the East, playing a team that a couple weeks ago was in the top of the West. It's a good chance to bash East and West, but I'm not going to do that. It, but it does show that. You always it, take the high road. It, 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 does, it shows <laughs> that we're not in balanced balance conf, conferences. Uh, our divisions are in balance. But, you know, this looks very good for a Rutgers team. Now, remember, uh, Greg Shiano was one of – uh, P.J. Flex mentor, so there's going to be emotion there. There's going to be the teacher playing the student, and I don't think a lot of teachers losing, like losing to their students, so there's a little bit of psychology there. Uh, but we never thought this game at the beginning of the year was going to be, you know, a toss-up, although I don't think that people that set the odds think it's a toss-up, but I think we think it's a toss-up and everyone that follows the game closely. What do you think has gone wrong with Minnesota here? Line of scrimmage, again, you know, we've talked about this. I mentioned this uh, this past tailgate pregame show that they have to gain four yards or more in first and ten. So they have to be second or six or better to make them have a manageable second and third down. That's just who they are. So if they can't run the ball in first and ten more than 50% of the time gaining four yards, they're at a disadvantage. They're averaging 20% of the time, 80% of the time, the defense is winning on first and ten. And then the, the counter to that, obviously, is stop running the ball, throw the ball, and that's where the RPOs come in in the pre-called pass plays, and they're having trouble protecting, and now they're second quarterback. Third, yeah. yeah, so, uh, you know, it's been, it's been tough going for them. I, I think a lot yeah. of – and the other thing is beware of really easy non-conference schedules. And, again, it, no, through, no, no fault that they're on like the You play Colorado, you think you're getting a good game. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Exactly. But, yes. man, that non-conference schedule messed us all up. It did. Especially them, not us. <laughs> More than us. It messed up us. our thinking. It, it messed up their season. Of 41 points last three games for Minnesota, I would argue the best unit in this game, I don't think it's close, is Rutgers defense. Yeah. Rutgers defense is really good. And not simple. So they're going to, you got a quarterback. If Tanner doesn't play, they're going to have a young quarterback taking the snap, and Greg will give him a bunch of different looks he's going to have to figure out. Yeah. Uh, top 10 defense yeah. nationally. Total teens. It's crazy how, how good they've been and, and really hard to run on, giving up fewer than 90 yards per game on the ground. And, and that obviously is the bread and butter with Mo Ibrahim no doubt. for Minnesota. So it should be interesting. Tomorrow, hockey is back on the Big Ten Network. The top-ranked Minnesota Golden Gophers will take on Ohio State, 11th-ranked team in the nation. The puck drops tomorrow, 6.30 Eastern, only on the Big Ten Network and the Fox Sports app. It is time to welcome in
Paul Caponigri, our Big Ten hockey analyst who joins us now. And, and Paul, let's, let's give people a big picture before we dive into that game. So last year was a really good year for the Big Ten, as we documented, ended up with two teams in the Frozen Four. They were both eliminated in the national semifinals. I was glancing through the rankings this year. You've got five of the top 16. I mean, it's a seven-team league. You've got five of them ranked, the other two receiving votes. So it feels like we're in a good spot again for the Big Ten. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, it is. And I, I, I jokingly want to say we want to keep up with women's volleyball. You know, we can't have them have all these success uh, with the ranked teams. But, yeah, it's it's a good start. It's, you know, it, surprising hockey's back, but it's, it's early October, but all signs right now are – it's going to be – I think the top was expected as it is right now with Minnesota, but I think lower down, I think the depth of the conference is going to show out, and uh, it's going to bring a lot of excitement. I Last year was great. I think, you know, barring some some crazy things, we're going to see a lot more excitement you see there. I mean, five teams in the top 16, that's just – you know, in the voting, you know, we'll talk about the pairwise later in the season. I know you love talking about that, Dave. Um, but yeah, I got the gonna, formula it's, memorized. It's, it's yeah, be, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, oh, God, I don't. So you could teach me a thing. But uh, yeah, it's going to be exciting. You love seeing a team at the top. But yeah, the depth of the league and some new coaches in that are bringing some new changes. It's exciting. So let's dive into some of these teams. It does not take a genius to figure out that Minnesota is a national championship contender. That little number one next to their name kind of gives it away. <laughs> so we'll get into them in a second. But who else we saw who's in the top 16? Who else do you legitimately yep. look at and say, at the end of the day, this is a team that could raise a national championship trophy? Sure. I, I think you can go with another three teams. I think I, Notre Dame is off to the slowest start, I think, of the teams. But they, they have like six graduate seniors. Uh, they brought in some transfers. I think they're still trying to find their way. But Jeff Jackson always has his team there in the end. They were a game away from the Frozen Four last year. Could add three Big Ten teams almost. Uh, I love – and then you got to look at the goaltenders. For Ohio State, Dobish was a goaltender of the year. He's off to a great start. Their team – is doing very well, too. Their power play is clicking. So they are a threat in the long run. They've been to a Frozen Four under Steve Rollick. And then, of course, Michigan. Michigan is so talented. It's just a recital. You, they lost all those guys from last year. But, oh, wait, they brought in the guy that's the number two ranked, going to be probably the number two pick in the draft. And he's off to a great start, Adam Fantilli. And they got the goaltender, too. And Eric Portillo, who decided to come back for his junior year. So I think there's four teams and, you know, I didn't even mention, like you said, Minnesota is going to is the cream of the crop right now. Um, they bring the most uh, most full package of any team at this moment. It has been a while. Michigan State in 07, the last team in the Big Ten to win it. Obviously, that was before there was actual Big Ten hockey. So in this formation right. of, of the conference, there's never actually been a, a Big Ten team that has won it. Let's talk about Minnesota. Bob Mosco just has an unbelievable collection of talent in Minneapolis Give us a sense. I mean, it was amazing to me to see some of these names of guys we were talking about last year who chose to come back. That really stood out to me, Cappy. It, it did, and I think that's great. I'm a proponent for guys. There's no rush to get to the pros when you're 18, 19 years old. Let yourself grow and mature at the college level. Be dominated at that level so then you – you're prepared to go to the next. They brought, you know, they got Brock Faber back, which I think everybody thought was going to leave. He's the captain. And, you know, Matthew Nyes, Toronto, you, Maple Leafs wanted him, but they, he's like, I need more time. I think that's great maturity. And that leadership, and when you talk like that, that trickles down to the other young guys. And, you know, they're not, they're not halfway in, halfway out. You know, some guys make that decision to come back, but they're already thinking about, okay, I'm going to play this year, but I'm, I can't wait for – you know, the end of the season and I can go to pro hockey. These guys are, they, they got their feet full in uh, with the Gophers and, you know, a couple other guys. They're, they're just a really deep team. And then they brought in some crazy talent. Uh, Cooley was the number uh, three pick, I believe, to the Arizona Coyotes. Uh, just, they're just uber talented. And they've got top to bottom, the deepest team, you know, in the country, I think, uh, Justin Close, you know well from last year, was the great story of replacing yeah, Jack LaFontaine. He is, yeah. you know, just came in this year, and he's the number one guy, and it's it's not even a question. So they haven't won it since 2003. They went back-to-back -back in 02 and 03. We'll see whether this is the year they break through. Last year certainly felt going into the year 
like Michigan was the favorite. As we know, they had an offseason of turmoil. They have a new coach, Brandon Dorado. But as you mentioned, there's still a ton of talent there. Give us a sense of how Michigan's going to be different and, and what we should expect in this new regime. Yeah, I think a fresh face, very young face. You know, he's in his, his 30s. Um, I think, you know, I, and I've talked about this before with people, it's building relationships. I think Brandon's got a good job, does a good job of communicating with these young guys. These guys are coming in and, you know, in a lot of other sports, these freshmen are coming in and becoming star players. And that's a tough dynamic to juggle because you have older players that are quote unquote, the leaders, uh, but you're relying on these young guys to produce and be your star players. So balancing those older and younger guys, for a, for a young coach, I think it's important uh, that you build the relationships and trust with them. And I think Brandon does a good job of that. And then, you know, the talent will take over. If, you, if you've got a good locker room uh, that, that he can put together, I think the talent will take over. Michigan does that. Like I mentioned Fantilli. They have other young guys. And then, of course, Luke Hughes that arguably, you know, the last half of last year was maybe the best player in college hockey. He came back for his sophomore year again maturing, developing his game, and take it to the next level only will help Michigan. Paul, give me a sense for Michigan State. I mean, it's kind of been a lost decade for the Spartans mm -hmm. hockey-wise. They've got a new coach as well, and Adam Nightingale. The early returns seem to indicate they are a much better offensive team than they were a year ago. But kind of what's going on in East Lansing, and is there hope for this thing to get back to where Spartan fans expect it to be? Yeah, I, I think it was perfect timing for this change, they finally got their facility done. They have brand new um, attachment to Mun Ice Arena that just catches up with the recruiting. But you got to have these pretty shiny new things, right, in recruiting. Um, young, again, another young coach with a lot of energy. And I, you, you hit on it. You beat me to it. I guess, Dave, you've been, you've been reading your, your homework <laughs> with the offense. I think that is the – you've just known the last – five to 10 years that they're going to, their way to win a game was like three to one or two to one. You know, now I think they have a little more offense or the style of play they're going to play. They're letting these guys go and play hockey, not worry about so much on defense, um, go out there, try to have some more fun. And you're seeing a little more out of them. I think it'll take time for them to build up the program again to an elite spot, but it's, they're in the right you're seeing it early on this year that they're in the right direction. Cappy, before we get to the game coming up this weekend, I do want to ask you really quick. We've talked about a lot of teams here, and you mentioned some individual performers we haven't really talked about, Penn State or Wisconsin, uh, Ohio State. Are there some individuals you haven't been able to get in that are people that fans ought to be aware of heading into this year? Yeah, I think the one guy that stood out for me, and, and he kind of snuck up on me, is a transfer for, uh, for Penn State tour. Linden, he had 20 goals last year playing out in, and I think RPI in the East and weren't a, wasn't a great team. So kind of under the radar, but he's come into Penn State and has been their offensive leader and kind of a guy they needed. They, they've got depth there. Uh, they didn't lose a lot from last year and he's just adding to that offense. And I think they're kind of like that fifth team. You're seeing them rise up the rankings. They're going to be in the mix for a national tournament. Once you get in, you got a, a, a chance. Uh, with Ohio State, I, I mentioned Dobish, but Mason Lorai on defense is just a sophomore sensation. He He's another – those are their two pillars that lead Ohio State. And then Wisconsin, you know, they had a huge weekend. Last weekend they beat Minnesota Duluth twice at their arena, which is a – you know, Duluth has been a powerhouse the last five, ten years. So I think that's going to give them a little confidence. They got some nice young players, Charlie Strammel is going to be a high draft pick. So Wisconsin maybe hopefully is turning a corner after that weekend. So you mentioned it. All the teams got votes last week. There's a, there's a, there's a lot. There's not going to be any week, easy weekends uh, in Big Ten play. So let's get it going this weekend. I'm excited. So real quick, give people a sense. Minnesota and Ohio State coming up here tomorrow on the Big Ten Network. We've talked a lot about the Gophers. You were mentioning some with the Buckeyes there. This is a series that Minnesota has owned through the years. What would it take for Ohio State to, to have a chance to do well this weekend? Yeah, I think special teams is going to be big. Their power play has been good. They have eight goals in eight games. I think that can set a tone. Minnesota's penalty kill has struggled a little bit, so that could be a, you know, a matchup you want to see. Minnesota's had success in Columbus of recent, but they're coming off uh, a big emotional non-conference weekend versus North Dakota where it was back and forth. And big crowd out at Mariucci this weekend. 
So it'll be interesting to see how they come out Friday, you know, that emotional letdown and see if the Buckeyes can take advantage of that on Friday. Um, but th- that's going to be a key thing. As, as you see, you know, it's hard to come back from a big weekend of emotions to, to go on the road. This is their first full weekend of road games and play a Buckeye team that plays, plays a good, solid, structured game. It's going to be a chess match of high-flying Minnesota offense versus good defensive structure for the Buckeyes. Ohio State just nine wins in 53 all-time meetings. See if they can add to that total this weekend. Paul, it is a long odyssey <laughs> to the spring and the postseason in Big Ten hockey, but great to have you along for the ride, and, and I look forward to us visiting many times during the course of this year. Sounds good, Dave. See you soon. All right, Paul. Take care, man.